In our previous session, we tried to establish a little foundational background on microbiology, the DNA, and so forth, in part to prepare us for this session, the second session, which I'm going to call the Pandora's box, because we're going to talk about chimera, what those are, agrogenetics a little bit, genetic athletes, and we'll also talk about the biblical precedents for some of this. The price of unbridled curiosity can be labeled, do not open under any circumstances. Pandora, this is a legend, of course, in Greek mythology, Pandora was the first woman on earth. I didn't realize that until I researched this a little bit. We've all heard about Pandora's box. The idea is that Pand the gods had given her a box and warning her never to open it. Why'd they give it to her in the first place? But anyway, they gave her, do not open under any circumstances, in effect. And of course, obviously, her, over, her curiosity finally overcame her. And she opened the mysterious box, out of which flew innumerable plagues for the body and terrors for the mind. And therein lies the myth or the, uh, of Pandora. So we're going to talk about the, the, this whole reality we're tampering with. We're tampering with the engines of creation in which we really don't understand their implications. And we're going to discover that the myths of yesterday can become the realities of tomorrow. You may also remember that there was a, uh, a uh, story by H.G. Wells, published in 1896, he published a science fiction novel called The uh, uh, Island of Dr. Moreau, that was, uh, it was a mysterious island, presumably inhabited by unnatural creatures. And these uh, creatures were the result of horrific uh, uh, experimentation, part animal, part human. And the novel tried to warn of the dangers of unchecked and irresponsible scientific research. Well, hybrid animals of that were imaginary in the days of H.G. Wells are becoming laboratory experiments. Hybrid animals, crossing species, are called chimeras. That's a term taken again from mythology, Greek mythology. It was a creature with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. And uh, so scientists have created sheep now that possess human hearts and livers. They have pigs that have been born with human blood, believe it or not. And uh, see, we're altering the genetic makeup, and what is becoming of great concern is that we may have opened the Pandora's box, because as we start crossing species, we open up the opportunity for diseases that we've never seen before, for which we have no cure. Let's talk of mice and men. Scientists at the Salk Institute in San Diego recently engineered mice that possess a small percentage of human brain cells. Scientists injected human embryonic cells in the brains of rodent fetuses, resulting in the birth of mice with both human and rodent brain cells. I know you can make a lot of remarks of people you may have met, but that's, we won't go there. One goal of the research is to make realistic models of neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease and Lou Gehrig's disease. So it has noble goals, but it's opening a nightmare here. Irving Weissman of Stanford University and his team injected human neural stem cells into mice, uh, into mouse fetuses. Weissman also helped make the first mouse with a nearly complete human immune system. Although the percentage of human uh, brain cells in existing mice is only about 1%, Weissman is considering making a chimeric mice with, with brains which are made entirely of human cells. Now see, the problem here is there are very few safeguards against errors or abuse. There are limitations when you start cross, uh, making cross-species, all kinds of things. When you start messing around this way, you open up a, 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 an avenue of contamination and involvement and mutations and what have you that can be disastrous. We can have unknown disease or complications. Now, we also have the potential of self-replicating mutations. All of these are impossible to fully anticipate. There are very few regulatory or procedural disciplines. There are small, intensely competitive laboratories, very few uh, government or established laboratories. These are often small ventures that are uh, racing for patents. We're not dealing in a, in a structured environment. We're talking about the... the uh, hurly-burly of a startup situation. You need to understand that closed-loop systems often operate counterintuitively. You can, in the winter, open a window 
and have a breeze blow on the thermostat to cause your house to overheat. In other words, the implications are, are, uh, can often be counterintuitive. Allergies are viewed as immune system overreactions. Cancer is really caused by regulatory anomalies. Cross-species diseases, of course, open this nightmare. Retroviruses can skip generations. You can create a disease that only your grandchildren will discover. And you have this whole idea of intelligent intruders fabricating diseases that have, have, have knowledge and that are directable. They're actually talking about making diseases that will target a specific DNA uh, category. That's where you get into the Chimera Bellerophon uh, weaponry. There's weaponry and counter weaponries already surfacing in the, in the entertainment media, but they're not very distant in terms of feasibility from the laboratory. Genetic weapon targeting. A European think tank in Stockholm said the free access to genetic sequence data for the human genome and the large number of other genomes, including for pathogenic uh, microorganisms, could pose a significant threat if misused. This information can be misused to make targeted genetic weapons. Terrorists might develop a pathogen that could target a specific ethnic group. According to the Scientists Working Group Biological and Chemical Weapons, the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. So the caution flags are flying. There's also the yuck factor. You see that mouse with an ear on it and so forth, you get sort of repulsed by that. Why? Is it just an obstacle to scientific discovery or is this evidence of a troubled conscience? Let's take an example of re from real life. In 1918, there was a flu virus that killed between 20 and 50 million people in just a couple of months. They called it the Spanish flu. They had no idea what caused it. It killed more people than the Black Plague of the Mid uh, Middle Ages or have killed in AIDS. They now, after a 10-year study, have reconstructed the, uh, the gene that did it. They took lung tissue from two soldiers and an Alaskan woman that all died in 1918. They dug up the graves and took samples and studied it, and they believe they've reconstructed what caused this peculiar flu. It was a bird flu that jumped directly to humans. This comes at a very interesting time because there's widespread panic going on because of the avian flu that is already um, uh, very serious and only a few small cases in humans, but they're very worried that if it jumps successfully into, into the human genome, it could wipe out major percentages of our population. See, apparently genetic changes cause the lethality that the, the, the bird flu was able to jump into the human genome. Now, pandemics, apparently, there were four occurring in the last century. They figure they occur about every 30 years. People had studied these things. The pandemics of 1957 1968 being examples. In 1968, the Hong, in Hong Kong, one, somewhere between one and four million people died. The avian flu could become a global pandemic if a strain develops that can jump readily from human to human. Experts estimate that one-third of the world population could get infected, over 50 million fatalities. Vaccines do exist, but in insufficient quantities. Let's shift to another subject. I'll call it agrogenetics, the dark side of genetically manipulated food. Is that a panacea for mankind or another Pandora's box? Genetically altered corn. Here's a disturbing case study. Starlink is a proprietary corn spliced with a powerful toxin, Bacillus thuringiensis, or commonly called BT. The controversial Cry 9C variety is 50 to 100 times more potent than any other BT spliced insecticide. Critics warned unfamiliar foreign proteins could set off dangerous food allergies in humans with symptoms ranging from fever, rashes, and diarrhea to anaphylactic shock and even sudden, sudden death. The FDA approved it only for animal feed. That sounds safe enough, doesn't it? Starlink corn has not yet been commercialized in any country other than the U.S. So this is a U.S. case study here. Kraft, the largest food corporation in America, had to recall two and a half million boxes of corn tacos. The USDA recalled all Starlink corn on 350,000 acres planted across the United States, over 400 brands of tortillas, shells, tostadas, chips, 
recalled from thousands of supermarkets throughout the United States. The largest food processors, Kellogg's, ConAgra, Archer Daniels Midland, and Tyson, shut down their grain mills. Avantis, Kraft, Safeway, Mission Foods, Western Family, Shaw's, Food Lion, Randall's, Kroger, Albertsons, and so forth, plus the grain elevators and farmers, face several hundred million dollars in losses. More than 28,000 truckloads, 15,000 rail cars, and 285 barges of corn tested positive for Starlink. Consumers claiming to have been poisoned by Starlink corn products have been filed multi-million dollar class action lawsuits. It's on the internet. You can check it out uh, under Starlink. Now let's talk a little bit about the international picture. The leading international producers of genetically engineered crops. The United States, 74 percent. Canada, 10 percent. Argentina, 15 percent. Economic sanctions could threaten a meltdown of the entire global free trade system in the minds of many. American, according to Andrew Kimball at Center for Food Safety, American consumers have been used as unknowing guinea pigs. Let's go on with this thing. The pollen from the BT corn turns out to kill monarch butterflies. Mexico is the winter home for the monarch butterflies who migrate south from Canada and the United States. It is also killing beneficial soil microorganisms and is thus damaging the entire soil food web, as well as killing beneficial uh, insects such as lacewigs and ladybugs. So there's echoes is continuing through the environment. Antibiotic marker genes, ARMs, are found in genetically engineered foods and animal feeds, and they have the ability to transfer antibiotic resistance to soil bacteria, bees, mammals, and other organisms, including humans. This gives rise to dangerous pathogens in humans that can't be killed then by traditional antibiotics. Major problem brewing here. The FDA admits that 8% of all U.S. children are now plagued by food allergies, and that situation is growing worse. 8%. Nutritionists warn of a suspected link between food allergies and asthma. The FDA's recall of genetically engineered nutritional supplement, uh, L-tritophan, still left 37 deaths and 5,000 injuries. According to the, the most, one of the most reputable journals in the field, New England Journal of Medicine, March 14, uh, 96, said unlabeled genetically engineered foods are uncertain, unpredictable, and untestable. And now we're getting into what they call super pests. There are now emergent markets for seeds with confirmed pedigrees for organic farming. Crop pests, beetles, boll worms, and corn borers, will inevitably develop resistance to the widely cultivated BT splice crops, creating super pests that could overwhelm organic farmers and could make organic agriculture more difficult, if not impossible. Tenth anniversary assessment. We're talking about the tenth anniversary here. Biotech beans, cotton, corn, and canola are the profit drivers at Monsanto Chemical. Also rival companies like Swiss-based uh, Syngenta and uh, Dow AgroSciences LLC, a unit of Dow Chemical Company. They genetically altered to withstand weed killers and insects, generate higher yields, and so forth. Cereal giant Kellogg Company recently announced it would start using a healthy, low linolenic oil derived only from Monsanto's biotech soybean in its cookies, crackers, and other food products. Less than two weeks later, rival Kraft Foods, the world's second largest food producer, said it would stop supplying all genetically engineered food products, including additives, to China due to a lack of market acceptance. PepsiCo and Coca-Cola Company have made similar pledges. In November, Swiss voters banned the planting of biotech crops for five years. In Australia, a biotech pea has caused health problems in research mice, forcing cancellation of that project. Last year, Monsanto was forced to withdraw a biotech wheat it planned to sell in the United States and Canada because of strong market opposition. Other failed projects include Monsanto's delayed ripening tomato and a healthier potato. Biotech products around the world are increasing and this year topped more than one billion acres sown to soybeans, corn, cotton, canola, and other crops. In the United States, from 2004 to 2005, 52% of all corn, 79% of upland cotton, and 87% of soybeans were of biotech varieties, according to the USDA. The barriers in Europe are slowly lowering, and emerging new products may help improve acceptance. Let's take rice, big deal. Iran last year became the first country to commercialize biotech rice, 
approving a pest-resistant variety. Syngenta has announced a new strain of golden rice that produces up to 23 times as much beta-carotene as previous varieties. Rice is to be available for free to research centers across Asia. And currently, the growing investment in agricultural technology in China, Argentina, Chile, and so forth, genetically modified rice is likely to gain approval in China in the near future, which could open the acceptance globally uh, in favor of the biotech food. And on it goes. Well, remember I said closed-loop systems often operate into, uh, counterintuitively. Allergies and, and cancer are regulatory anomalies in intelligent tutors. Cross-species diseases, retroviruses, we've talked about these, each one of these. Let's talk about nanotechnology. Nanotechnology involves the manufacture and manipulation of materials at the molecular or atomic level. The smallest things can get. That's what nanotechnology is all about. At that scale, materials are measured in nanometers, or billionths of a meter. That's why they call it nanotechnology. A sheet of paper, in comparison, is 100,000 nanometers thick, to give you a feeling for this. The potential for nanomaterials could have enormous effects on much of what we do, including developing drugs and dealing with toxic pollution. Nanomaterials already are being used in at least 80 consumer products made by U.S. companies. Okay. So there's nanotechnologies that deals with mo molecule-sized machines. Okay, got it. There's another technology called robotics, trying to make not just robots, but self-modifying sentient machines, those that can simulate cognitive behavior. And there's a third field, of course, called genetics, where we try to make self-replication of manipulated entities. We try to make not only a manipulated entity, but one that will replicate itself. The reason I'm getting into this, all three of these technologies are converging. Nanotechnologies, robotics, and genetics are all converging. One of the goals that can be pursued by this convergence would be a self-replicating sentient machine capable of a directable disease targeting specific groups of individuals. Now you think that through, that's pretty terrifying. If that technology had been f available to a Stalin or a Hitler, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Now that leads us, of course, to bioterrorism, the legacy of hate that drives it. See, bio biological weapons are terrible weapons militarily because they're hard to control and, and direct and so forth. But they are a dream weapon for a terrorist because symptoms can be delayed for many days, facilitating the safe escape of the perpetrators. If they're contagious, that contagion can spread throughout the whole culture. One person on an airplane on a coast-to-coast -coast flight can infect the entire plane load before they land. And of course, treatments are at best elusive and uncertain. Inoculation availability is always going to be limited. Logistics of limited supplies, triage, and quarantines are issues that are impossible to satisfactorily resolve. And we could go through the NBC weapon, nuclear and biological and chemical weapons. The technology, of course, nuclear is, 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 the, is the most difficult. The cost is the highest. It also has the most conspicuous signature of detection. And, by, and, and effectiveness for both protected and unprotected personnel, it's pretty high. But when you look at biological for strategic purposes or chemical for tactical purposes, they also rank very inexpensive, very high. And we could go through a whole list of the pathogens that are currently being marketed on the international arms market there are all kinds with all kinds of different characteristics, anthrax being a, a hideous one, but we could go through the whole list. We won't for this purpose. But let's talk a little bit about anthrax. The, it's comparable to the lethal fallout of a ground burst nuclear weapon, according to the Army uh, uh, Materiel Research People in the Institute for Infectious Diseases. 100 kilograms in Washington, D.C. would result in 1 to 3 million deaths, 300 times, the, the, 10 times the amount of sarin, according to the Con Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. 50 kilograms in a large city, say of 5 million, would result in 100,000 deaths, 240,000 incapacitated, according to the, world, to the WHO, the World Health Organization. In terms of biological or chemical weapons, the, the Proving Ground in Utah says that they're more, the biological are more lethal, more broader coverage, and more bang pound for pound. Virtually all the major co countries are developing bioweapons, Iran, Iraq, even, even Iraq, clearly we had a lot of, we discovered a lot of their materials. Libya, Syria, North Korea, Taiwan, 
Israel, Egypt, India, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, Bulgaria, South, South, South Korea, South Africa, China, Russia, our list. This is from the Office of Technology Assessment, U.S. Senate hearings. The world biochemical margin. The, Russia is the largest, most aggressive pur purveyor of these materials. Iraq had developed a dozen different pathogens, including genetically altered microorganisms, including anthrax and others, were in production. North Korea presently offers 13 different kinds of bacteria produced by nine different plants just for export. And of course, the lab facilities for this kind of thing are virtually impossible to identify. They're not like radiation and nuclear stuff. And uh, with traditional surveillance, you have a tough time. Let's talk about something a little different. What about genetically engineered athletes? That's coming down the pike, too. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University have discovered a gene in mice which controls growth, the GDF8. This growth differentiation factor uh, disrupts uh, the uh, yielded a uh, super mice, made, it yielded super mice three times larger and much stronger, according to the article in Nature magazine. Seven years ago, H. Lee Sweeney at the University of Pennsylvania was investigating ways that gene therapy might help people with muscular dystrophy or elderly patients that had uh, muscle mass that was dangerously declined. Sweeney created a synthetic gene that promotes an insulin-like substance, encouraging muscle cell growth, and he used a tiny virus to carry the gene into the muscles of laboratory mice. The mice grew 15 to 30 percent larger than normal, even though the mice had no exercise. And when middle-aged mice were genetically enhanced, uh, they, they grew to old age and retained their mega muscles. C. Jin Lee, a John Hopkins researcher, accelerated muscle growth in mice by blocking the gene that produces a protein that limits muscle growth. And children with this rare mutation naturally can be exceedingly strong for their age. Another researcher genetically modified the fat-burning abilities of mice muscles to significantly increase endurance. In 2003, researchers were able to genetically increase the level of erythropoietin EPO, in rhesus monkeys. EPO is a hormone that encourages red blood cell formation and is used clinically to treat diseases like anemia. But it's also notoriously used by athletes to improve endurance in events like cross-country cross skiing and cycling. The genetic modification in some of the monkeys worked very well, so well, in fact, that it thick, their thickened blood had to be diluted for them to survive. And other monkeys, uh, uh, in other monkeys, their own immune systems attacked the novel EPO as well as their natural EPO, leading to severe anemia. ACTN3. For a year now, a company in Australia, Genetic Technologies Limited, they offer a DNA test that detects variations in the ACTN3 gene. The ACTN3 gene produces a protein that enhances the kind of operation that we call a fast twitch in muscle fiber, the kind that is involved in activities like sprinting or power lifting, as opposed to endurance sports like marathons. In one variation of ACTH3, the production of the protein is repressed. So while muscles re remain normal, they have much less of the fast twitch enhancer. Everyone has two copies of the gene, one from each parent. So it's possible to have one, two, or no repressed versions of the ACTN3 gene. In a study of 300 elite level athletes, including 500 Olympians, every one of the sprint power athletes tested had at least one normal copy of the ACTN3 gene. All were producing at least some of the fast twitch protein enhancer in their muscle fibers. Endurance event athletes were more likely to have two copies of the repressed variant. The absence of the fast twitch protein may have supported the development of slower, more efficient muscle fiber. Genetic Technologies cautions that the test, which is sold only in Japan and Australia for about $100, doesn't predict a champion. There are too many other factors for that. But it is intended to help athletes choose what events they should train for or shouldn't train for. That's the use so far. But it may go further. See, despite the serious dangers, genetic manipulation is likely to be an emerging trend in highly competitive events, especially when backed by ambitious governments. You can, you can fill in the blanks. Testing genetically altered athletes is also likely to be very difficult, involving muscle biopsies, and the search for very subtle changes and so forth. It's a difficult area. Well, now let's get down to the other aspect of this, the biblical precedents. We're tampering with the human genome. Are there biblical precedents for this sort of thing? 
Well, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 again. He said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the uh, coming of the Son of Man be. In order to understand what he meant, you have to understand what it was like in, his, in the days of Noah. When you read Genesis 6, the first two verses are a single sentence. That's important to be sensitive to. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God, this translates the Hebrew word, benai ha Elohim, which is uh, translated sons of God. It is always used of angels in the Old Testament, in Job and several places and, and uh, elsewhere. In the book of Enoch, which is not part of the Bible, but it's a valuable reference from about the 2nd century B.C. through the 2nd century A.D., in terms of grammar, lexicon, and what the rabbis believed. They, they clearly saw this text as referring to angels, fallen angels, of course. Also, the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, done three centuries before Christ was, uh, Christ's ministry. Uh, we have, it translates this term as angels. But it goes on, then it's, when it says, speaks of the angels here, other phrase there, is Banoth Adam, the daughters of Adam. I want you to notice that's not the daughters of Cain, it's the daughters of Adam, with not distinction. So the sons of God, these fallen angels apparently, saw the daughters of men in general, that they were fair, and took them wives. When you get down to the fourth verse, there's a disturbing remark. It says, there were Nephilim in the land in those days. That word is translated giants, but it comes from the Hebrew word nephal. The Nephilim comes from the uh, term nef the, to fall away, to be cast down, to desert. The Nephilim are the fallen ones. These were the hybrids the angels were trying to create. These fallen angels cohabited with women and were somehow able to create hybrids in an attempt to distort the, the messianic line. They gave, it gave birth to the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. These, these were giants, but that's not what the word really means. The word in the Greek is gigantis, which is transliterated giants, but it really means the earthborn. It comes from gigos, the earthborn. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, and yet his days shall be numbered 120 years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This happened not only before the flood, it also happened subsequently, and you need to understand that if you're going to understand the Old Testament history and the Old Testament prophets. There's another verse of note here in the ninth verse of chapter 6. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. The word perfect in his generations, the word in the Hebrew is tamim, which means without blemish, without spot, unimpaired. It speaks of physical defects. One of the distinctives of Noah, and there are several, but one of the distinctives was that his, his genealogy had not been contaminated by this mischief of the fallen angels. The New Testament, if this is a correct perspective, the New Testament will confirm it. It does it in three places. In Jude, verse 6 and 7, the angels which kept not their first estate, Jude talks about, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness into the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example. He goes on to make his point. But I want you to notice that Jude makes reference to his readers about these angels which fell, did this mischief, that are now at the moment incarcerated in a special case for a special judgment. Left their own habitation. Why? They were going after strange flesh and so forth. The word Oketarian occurs only twice in the New Testament, in Jude 6 and 2 Corinthians 5, 2. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about aspiring to our resurrection bodies. For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And that word house there is Oketarian. That same word is used by second, uh, uh, this also, can, excuse me, that, that's, the, that, that's the same word that's used in Jude 6 of the angels that disrobe from. In uh, Second Peter 2, Peter says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them in the chains of darkness, be reserved in judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. He not only makes reference to the same event, he even ties it to the days of Noah. And uh, the word Tartarus is a t difficult word. It's the only place it shows up in the New Testament. But it, it's a Greek term for the dark abode of woe. It's the pit of darkness of the unseen world. In Homer's Iliad, it's described as being as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So I don't know where it is, but I don't want to go there. 
So this is a, the commonly taught lines of Seth view emerged in the fifth century. It's commonly taught in many, in many seminaries. Many people think, well, what was really going on was, this, was just the lines of Seth commingling with the line of Cain, but they weren't supposed to. That view emerged in the fifth century. It has no scriptural support. It can be shredded on several ways. The fallen angel view was the view of the ancient Hebrew scholars. It was the view of the early church. It prevails among conservative scholarship today, and it's confirmed uh, at least three times in the New Testament. The Sethite view uh, d does, does violence to the text itself. It implies a separation that was not called for. It, it assumes that the Sethites were the godly ones. They were not. It infers that the Canaanite was, a sub uh, it was only the subset of the Adonites. It also doesn't deal with the unnaturalness of the offspring. And of course, the New Testament, it, doesn't, it, it confirms the other. And, but more, perhaps more important for you and I as students of the Bible, you won't understand post-flood and prophetic issues unless you really understand the angel view of what's going on in Genesis 6. That was the traditional biblical view, uh, rabbinical view. The Book of Enoch is just, uh, not, not because it's not an inspired source, but it's used for grammar and, and history. The Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs is another such source. J uh, Josephus and the Septuagint are all uh, supporting uh, uh, views. The early church fathers, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, um, had, saw it as the fallen angel view. It's interesting that the same view is embodied in the ancient legends of virtually every ancient culture on the planet Earth. Sumer, Assyria, Egypt, Incas, Mayan, Gilgamesh, Persia, Greece. The Greek the mythology is full of the, the, uh, the half-gods, the demigods, and so forth. Um, India, Bolivia, even the South Sea Islands, and even the American Indians have these traditions. When we talk about Hercules or Atlas, in the Hebrew they'd be Nephilim. These were hybrids of God dwelling with man and so forth. And there were giants, by the way, throughout history. Stephen Quayle has a wonderful anthology of all of these, including a lot of very provocative pictures from the past. But we won't spend too much time on that. In the Bible, there are prohibitions. There was a death penalty for lying with a beast. Interesting. Death penalty for one lies with a beast, both shall be killed. Does genetic transfers of human DNA into animals suggest that we are entering a period which Jesus likened to the days of Noah? That's a suggestion. Some people think so. There's also this bizarre attempt to try to clone Jesus by some. Their concept is to take a DNA sample from a religious relic, do a nuclear transfer to a stem cell, get a virgin surrogate mother. By the way, this has got to be a very high-risk enterprise. Even the sheep dolly involved 276 failures before they got one. So you've got to find some volunteers here. What's interesting, though, there's some historical evidence to suggest... See, one of the things they're thinking of doing is trying to get a DNA sample from the Shroud of Turin. But there's also this strange, these strange remarks about the Antichrist. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. From Revelation 17, 11. Many scholars have different views on that. But one of the possibilities that you can, it's hard to refute is that it, could, it might be referring to a clone. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, is of the seven, and goeth in perdition. I'll let you run with that. I have a little different view, but that's neither, not the place for it here. And uh, then, of course, we have the most famous verse in Revelation to many people. Revelation 13, 18. He caused both the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. People who know nothing else about the Bible all know about the 666. Most people presume and they, uh, that this has something to do with gematria or gematria or gematria. And uh, uh, the point, the problem here is that there's many official forms of gematria, at least seven listed here. And uh, you can, uh, what this really says is you can make any name somehow fit if you try hard enough. There's an expression in the computer industry I'm fond of. It says, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. And that's what many people do with these constructions. Now, the 666, if you take the word Christos in the Greek, it's the first, you take the first and last letter and put a serpent between the two, you get the, a symbol for the Antichrist, or pseudo-Christ is more precise. Antichrist is misleading. The term actually means in the place of Christ. He's against Christ, of course, but it's the, it, it's the instead of Christ that's the key part of it. But if you take those three, uh, the, the first and last and the, the serpent in the middle, you end up with 660 and 6 from the, the Greek uh, geometrical values, so it's 666. 
But the question is, whose numbers? People get all upset. Christians get all upset with, you know, credit cards and barcodes and so forth. Many point to barcodes and insertable chips. For now, this may be very important to implement the technology of control that this final world dictator will enjoy. No question about it. But they may not have anything to do with identity, what we're talking about. So the fact that barcodes, some of them use six as a separator symbol. People make a big thing of that. I think it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, the insertable chips that's being used in livestock and other in inventory control applications, that's coming. What they all overlook is that it's not our number or number, the number that we have that's the issue. It's his number that we take as an identity of allegiance to him. That's the critical issue. People miss that point. I think that the reason that people take his mark on their hand or their forehead is probably derives from the only physical description we have in the Bible. That's in Zechariah 11, the last verse. Where Zechariah says, Woe to the idol, that's I-D-O-L, like an idol worshiper. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock. He, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. This apparently refers to the head wound that Revelation talks about several times. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. It's interesting, it's a speculation, but maybe these impairments of his arm and his eye is a vestige of this head wound that is so prominent in the book of Revelation. And maybe those that are pledging allegiance to him take his mark on their hand or their forehead or both to demonstrate or be an insignia of the, that allegiance. Who knows? We'll see. But let me mention another technology you probably haven't heard other people talk about. And that's to reach out and touch someone. Before you leave a business, imagine this coming up now. Before you leave a business-related luncheon, you shake hands with five different colleagues, and in so doing, you collect their electronic business card information through a simple handshake. You walk out to the parking garage where a car unlocks as you touch the door handle. And you pick up your son from school, and he hops in the car. He sticks a wireless headset in your ear. It says, hey, Dad, you got to listen to track three. What we're dealing with here in, is red tactin technology. Through the latest advances in photonics and optics, electronic data can now be sent over the surface of a human body. Human skin has electromagnetic fields over which electronic information can pass. Red tactin is the term used by Nippon Telegraph and Telegraph Corporation, uh, Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, um, and. Uh, they, uh, their transceivers contain electro-optic technology that uses these naturally occurring electrical fields to send data at 10 megabits per second over the surface of the human body. So drop your MP3 player or your PDA or your cell phone into your pocket without missing a beat, literally, because the current never actually touches the human body itself, only its electromagnetic fields. You do not have to take your ID card from your pocket. Just touching or walking with your PDA in your pocket is enough for authentication. The electronic information from your MP3 player could be transmitted to your dance partner's earphones as you hold hands. <laughs> See, the devices do not actually have to touch the skin. So Red Tactin also provides a way to pay bills or to gain access to secure locations by a mere touch of the finger. Well, so much for that speculation. We'll see if it, it, it seems to be coming. The restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2 may be restraining far more than we have any idea. It's my personal belief that once the rapture occurs, the world at large will become more bizarre, more strange than we have any capacity to imagine. It's going to be the biggest shock of the planet Earth has ever had, and it's going to be probably more strange than we could possibly portray in a science fiction movie or something of that nature. After the restrainer's removal, the world will prove to be far more... Uh, we, there's no way I, I would be able to imagine doing a science fiction movie that would try to capture that, or if I could, it would look so bizarre as to be unacceptable. Well, let's stand back from all of this and summarize. Man is presently invading a world of which he has only the faintest glimpses. The uncharted impacts can replicate unseen, can, can transcend borders, species, and generations. Only the most committed can persist in denying the role of a deliberate creator. There's two things we're learning here. 
as we learn the horrors that are possible, that's the one side of it. The other hand, we also can't help but gain an awe and a respect for the designer who put it together in the first place. Absolutely fantastic. To ascribe it to, re, uh, to uh, random, unaided chance is ludicrous and definitively defined as absurd. See, you and I are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's take a look at Psalm 139 again. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being incomplete. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, this alludes to his design occurring before the fabrication and so forth. Fabulous stuff. Biotech. The Sources Apprentice. Now we have a website you should check out. It's the largest, one of the largest, oldest websites on the internet, www.khouse.org. No one can pronounce Koinonia House, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us K-House, khouse.org. And then we also participate with the Blue Letter Bible people, English, Hebrew, Greek text, commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedias, all of it's word searchable, terrific study aid. But one of the things we're really all about is to encourage you to get into a home study group in your neighborhood. There are probably some there already. Check them out. Find one you like. If you can't find one, start one. We'll help you. But if you take your personal spiritual growth seriously, you need to get into a, st a small study group. Forty-five minutes on a Sunday sermon once a week ain't going to do it. You want to get into a small group study group. It's where it all happens. In the 50 years I've studied the Bible, that's where I've seen people grow. I hope this was edifying. I hope it challenges you to take your spiritual life seriously and keep alert to the strategic trends that are impacting all of us. God bless you.